That's the Premium Podcast, where we focus on breaking down risk management problems bit by bit until we find a solution. If you would like to discuss anything you hear on GPP with us, please reach out using the links in the description. Enjoy today's episode. All right, man. Thanks for coming in. Looking forward to this one. Welcome, Rick. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Good to be up here. Yeah, so uh, I think there's some interesting, uh, you know, takes that you have that we can give to the audience in not only kind of what, how you guys have built Unico, your firm, uh, but also some of the different divisions within Unico that you have an interesting perspective on that I think we'll focus. But maybe just real quick, give give a little bit of the the who Unico is, who you are, um, and then we'll kind of jump into some of how you've built those different divisions and things. I'd be happy to, Elliot. Thanks. Thanks, man. Um, Unico, Unico Group, Lincoln, Nebraska, started October 1, 1988. Probably a typical general agency with a little employee benefits, commercial, personal. Um, but uh, we've kind of expanded, we have home offices, now we have employees on both coasts in North Carolina and, and Oregon and Minneapolis, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Denver, all the way in between, but still definitely a Nebraska-based organization and yep. uh, proud to be. Yeah, wow. Totally. So in, in the, the firm, as we were talking on, we call it show before the show, right? Because <laughs> uh, there's always a lot of good stuff. But the firm started, you know, with a merger of two, you know, insurance agencies, right? And then we were talking early 2000s is where, you know, you would kind of peg it when you, you started early 2000s and then a little bit later you started some different divisions of the company, which are really what maybe propelled kind of your model and things that, that um, you guys are doing today. One of those, which I think is super intriguing, I think the audience can get a lot out of is your Unitel program very much starting as a niche, but has grown to something probably much more than a niche. So maybe give your thoughts as when you guys were looking to start that. I think a lot of firms or a lot of agents in the industry here, like you got a niche, you got to be niche focused now, you know, all those things. And then everybody's like, well, what in the hell does that mean? And how do I start it? What do I do? And where should I pick? And what if I pick this niche and somebody over here wants me to do business? So like maybe give your thoughts when you were just like, how did it start? Was it organic? Did you make an uh, intended decision to do that? Like, wh- what was the, the start to Unitel? You bet. I'll, I'll, I'll back up for a second and then I'll look to some good fortune too. But I came on board August 1 of 2002 and actually came on with a niche focused already clear back in those days. It was going to be not communication companies, not telephones, <laughs> not Unitel. It was going to be lumber yards. We had never really uh-huh. part of how I got the opportunity to come at Unico is there was a relationship built with Indiana Lumbermans and a gentleman named yeah. Dean Pullman who came in and said, Hey, I have some lumber yards I'd like to write. And, and my partners that were there at the time said, uh, we've got this young guy we'd like to hire. It might be a nice fit. So from day one had a niche. And I think that year I wrote 26 package on lumber yard accounts and 44 were comp accounts in 2002 out of the gate, but really focused on it. So I had a min, uh, mentality for niche already. Um, I'd love to say there was a big plan on Unitel. There was, and yeah. I, I'd, uh, again, August 1st, 2002, my very first day on the job, we didn't write one telephone company as at Unico at the time. It wasn't a niche. It wasn't anything. Um, Scott Nelson, our president at the time, is now retired, still like a father to me, said, hey, Rick, you want to kind of go to lunch? It's your first day on the job. Uh, I've got a meeting after lunch at Rimbolt Ludkey Law Firm in Lincoln, um, and you might as well just come along and kind of listen to see what I do for a living. And so he took me out to Runza in Nebraska. You got oh, to yeah. go, go to Runza on your first day. <laughs> Super fancy. And we went across the street to uh, Rembolt Lutke, who's now actually above us in the building in Lincoln. Um, but at the time was uh, across the street from there. We met with a company called Bankelman Telephone. And the idea was we weren't looking at their insurance or anything else. They had flown in on a private plane and just were good friends. Um, Tim Clare at Rimbold, now Board of Regents, was their attorney. And then Jim Slattery that specialized in accounting and telecommunications companies. And they came in and we just sat and listened to that and we had came and said, we'll look at a consulting agreement to review um, your coverage is what you have. I'll do the disaster recovery program, risk management that you talked about earlier in the, in the meeting before the meeting, just kind of all the things we can do for you. And we didn't bid their insurance at all. We said we'd be happy to do that and we'll bill you $1,800 for it. No problem. We leave. Scott's like, I had run a, my, my background earlier was a, uh, running a claims office prior to that. He's like, you got your CPC, you got claims. How about you just do the whole agreement? Um, and we'll split it 50, 50, the money is $1,800. The company gets half. We get $450 each. That was the whole, this, this is <laughs> very first day of the job. We get That's back to the office. Way. I spend probably 30 days putting this pro- proposals together to them. Mm-hmm. They love it. They actually 
five years in a row, they, they were a client doing the consulting. I finally had to fire them because I felt like I couldn't bring any more value to them. And because we started this program, we'll talk about it in a minute, um, went well. I think 30 days later, um, Tim Clark calls back and says, hey, they love what you did there. Uh, Fall City wants you to do theirs. And then I think we did Hemingford and I think maybe Arapahoe that, that your dad and yeah. I wrote. So we started, I think by within a year, I had did six of these probably. Scott, the, on the consulting agreement. All consulting. None of them we asked for the insurance. None of them we said we wanted. We didn't pitch it. We, in fact, our agreement just kept us even from proposing that. A lot of times we were building like, you know, just a disaster, a tornado. If you had a fire, what would happen? We'd go through employee handbooks for them. This is those things maybe are more common yeah. today, yeah. but in 2002 they were they were pretty rare. Yeah, right? that was 100%. And so it was all built around that. I think my last one was maybe 120 pages long on engagement. And Scott's like, you can just have all of it. It's 900 bucks. You're doing all the work. I'm just trying to help a young guy out. Yeah. Appreciate it. And that's kind of what got started. It wasn't this pre-planned niche or we're going to take it to where we're at today. That would have been going on now in 03. Some of the people younger listening, maybe this was a hard market for work comp, probably the yeah. last hard market for work comp we've had. And so none of the carriers wanted to have it. What they didn't know at the time is uh, one of the carriers had this program, was writing this, been around since 1968, and they wanted to get out of doing work comp. So as I'm coming in, all these consultant, the, the guys that keep losing business based on my advice um, or more package generated, they have a DNO product that's not very good, they're losing DNO. They came and said, hey, we think our program might be over. If we don't find a solution for work comp, can you help? So again, it wasn't us pitching, us asking for anything. It was these consulting agreements after consulting agreements. So by June of 2004, um, we came back in and said, we found a solution for you to do the work comp. And on, on uh, June 30th of 2004, so still not even two years from that first little consulting, we did about 430 accounts at $8 million in premium work comp only on that day without ever pitching or proposing. In fact, they gave us the loss runs, the experience mods, and the deck sheets. Every month they would just come in. And at that point, um, states like Nebraska were just, we still didn't have credits and debits yet. They were 05 when they were coming out, but a lot of states already did. This was 04. Most of the stuff was already written high enough that our agreement with the carrier we had partnered with was, we're just gonna write it flat. So we were able to come in and debit most of that stuff, even get more on it, and we did um, about $8 million of premium mm. and at 10% commission on work comp, and nobody paid 10 points in those days, everything was five, mm -hmm. and we, we hired our first risk manager, but that was initially with myself, and I hired one uh, account manager to help me just in that program that we hired her in, in 2004, that's kind of how we got started. Wow. Yeah, those are the, always the best niche, you know, mm -hmm. type of stories because it's it comes out of a need. It comes out of like it's natural. It's organic, you know, very – there are some people that have built niches that we'll hear about that were very intentional about it. You know, they said this – I see a need here. I can build a program. I can do this. I'm going to grow it to there. Um, but normally you hear it's something like that where it's like I – I was in on a few accounts, I started to write a couple more, you know, brought in a few more here, had a referral source, and all of a sudden I've got, you know, eight million in premium and it's a niche, like it's a it's a division, you know, or whatnot. And and I think some of that just comes too with you learn the expertise, you learn the language, and you do it organically. When you try to force a niche, people can tell, like, you don't yeah. know my business. Like, you know, how how many other people do you write in this business and things like that. So uh, I think that's an awesome story. So fast forward, where is it at today and, you know, where does that, as you call it now, a division of Unico. Yeah. Real so, quick, Elliot, I want to hop in before we go forward. Like, I think, because this is crazy in terms of, I mean, we have a lot of people on and talk to a lot of people in the industry and still, like, coming at it from a pure consultant perspective is rare. And this was 20 years ago. Yeah. So, like, what was the mindset in the firm at that point around just what you were doing and how you were doing it and how much traction were you getting versus the people who were going out and still trying to, you know, write the next account and to ring the commission bell and da 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 da. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And, and it's getting product of where you're at in time. Um, I had started out to do that lumber, right? And so that's what was gonna be the cash cow. This was just a hobby. Yeah. And blessed <laughs> to have a couple partners that were like, hey, you just, you're the young guy. I mean, at that point, I was 32 or 33, so I had 10 years of insurance so experience but was young to the agency. Low risk to them. Low risk. It's a little, they looked at it initially as this is 
small money. These are these yeah. small little consult. And I, I love the idea for me with my background in, in claims, litigation. Mm-hmm. I'm going through contracts. I'm reviewing stuff. And it was an opportunity to help, you know, just as a service, again, service oriented. They needed something. What happens, what makes this kind of unique is in, in Nebraska at the time, and now we're in almost all 50 states now, but at the time, um, there's only 19 of these accounts. They would, be, they would be called independent local exchanges or ILEX. It's a regulated industry controlled by the government of how much profit they can make. So that's why the accountant that was referring these in is, is a specialization in that industry. And they and basically almost all of those would use him for their accounting and they may use Tim uh, for their, so it was kind of a, a cool small yeah. world there. Mm-hmm. And they were asking for this help and understanding this better. What was also going on and just, again, recognizing uniqueness, recognizing details. Sometimes I think producers, sales teams don't always get into the details as much as they should. And that's where the opportunity really is. Right. But what happened is we, it was a time in the early 2000s where we're going from landline phones, those are regulated, yeah. to cell phones and those are not. And what happened now, the regulated side of the industry worked, is they got a 17% profit on anything that was eligible, like employee benefits, insurance. So the more that insurance cost, the <laughs> more profit they could make. Anything. That's so, backwards. So they had their health insurance. They would have no deductible, no coinsurance. Their board members, board members' families, because those were all considered eligible expenses, yeah. right? So you had a you had a world of 50, 60 years of nobody really cared. In fact, the higher it was, the better, right? Unique situation. Yeah. Going into a world when people are buying, do you have a landline phone? No. Do you yeah. have a landline phone? And that was just starting back in the mid-2005, 2006, and the numbers have been going down every year. None, that side of it's not regulated at all. So now you have to come out of those dark ages as the owners of these companies and start saying, I need insurance advice, I need help. No. I, I can't put this at risk, these are cash cows, but I also need to be able to evolve. So it was a time they had a lot of needs from our industry and still maybe a lot of our industry was still the people that were just calling on trying to quote their insurance mm-hmm. and not really helping them walk through. So there was definitely a need that we were fulfilling. And you saw that opportunity. I did probably a little bit what, again, uh, you know, I didn't, I think some young people come into the business and they all want a book of business given to them or handed to them because it helps pay the bills or validates. One of the cool things for me is I walked in and didn't have a book of business, like go focus on this lumber stuff and then figure out what other things you can do. So it gave me time to see that and to work with them. And when you're young and don't have a large book, you're spending a lot of time. And I was seeing these things come together. And then probably also what helped was that period that that first year of doing those consulting agreements to late that year you know 12 months later i'm already working on putting this proposal together on this work comp that then becomes a career changer right if you go do 800,000 in revenue and you've been the company for two years yeah. you'd probably hire a few people like that i imagine Elliot. yeah <laughs> yeah that would work yeah and so yeah well that's that's awesome yeah well, is that it, something scott was doing a lot of sorry those just small consulting agreements i mean was he scott being your boss, one of the owners of the firm at the time. Yeah, no, but no. There was just something he made up on the fly, like he's in this meeting and so said, hey, it, we can do all the that. The first one was definitely Scott's idea. It wasn't mine. I wouldn't take credit for that. It, I think it was more the client who said, hey, we'd like you to look uh, at this. We'd like this understanding. They didn't really call it consulting. And they said, we'd just like to get a better understanding of what we've got. We don't really understand what we've got and we've, who's coming in and where we're going. Can you help? And Scott said, I'd be happy to do that. So the first one was his idea to fill that need. He really wasn't doing a lot at the time, if any of it really at the time. And so that very getting first day in the job, it's one o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. I've been there for five hours and we sit down and listen to the story. And by listening in that meeting, I didn't have to lead the meeting. I'm the new guy just sitting there, kind of, yeah, the new guy's just going to sit here and be quiet. And you listen, you can really learn a lot if you listen in this life, you know, right? So when we left, we started talking about what that might look like. Because, you know, you've met Scott a few times oh, yeah. earlier that. Sometimes he speaks without thinking either. Hey, we just, we just, we just have a, what would that actually look like? And I think there was a great deal of confidence with him and, and in our friendship. Again, he's like a father to me now that I trust you can do that piece. But the vision was really looked at like just small stuff. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't going to be big. Yeah. Well, and like I said, that's how a lot of that starts. I, I was just wondering, I mean, if, if that those types of consulting agreements or work were done in other areas of the business, you know, or things like that, because, um, that's intriguing that it was just 
Yeah, the decision made with the client made sense on both sides. So I know we're limited on time today, but at the end of it, I'll get to where we're doing a lot more consulting again now and more in the rest of the business, but specifically still the heritage in this division is still there. Um, but yeah, no, they weren't. It would, it would have been pretty rare for us then too. I'd love to say we were way ahead of the time and doing all kinds of consulting <laughs> agreements back in 2002. We weren't. Yeah, this was this was pretty rare. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I'm sorry. I wanted to get some context around that. So. No, I think that's that's spot on. So yeah, take it from kind of there to you know where it's at today. Anything that sticks out in between, you know, because okay. you were you were obviously building it and then going into um, you know 2008 and everything that happened there. And so just yeah. you know, some of your thoughts around that progression of that niche into more of that division. You yeah, know? I'll, I'll go as quick as I can, and then you guys can back me up if you need something more with it. But so that first year, really, when we, when we went in away from just the pure, pure consulting, I mentioned a couple of those clients still wanted me to consult a couple of years later. Well, as we started to write that work comp, you're kind of walking both sides of it now. And you have a couple of people who are losing business. And wait a minute, they're losing it to us, and I'm the consultant on it. That I finally did have to fire the last two clients. I, said, I just can't, I can't, you know, do this when I'm looking at it and trying to also then sell you. So we did have to. The pure consulting in that arrangement, being completely independent, we did have to stop a couple years later. But so the, the first niche, we started doing the work comp. And what happened was the main the main product that we were partnering with was a package product that was built just for this industry um, in 1968. At this point, QB had just come into the United States. They bought it in 04, 05. So they still had a really poor DNO product. And they could only do umbrella to maybe five or ten million, and some of these clients were big. There's a lot of small ones too. So the next year, we probably did a million of DNO. Um, now I think we write six or seven million in that space, but about a million in DNO around the country, as well as excess, about another million dollars there. So we still kind of stayed that side where we're doing about eight million in comp and maybe about two million, and we weren't writing any package business at all. And again, we continue to not pitch, not try to just sell or just pitch a number or just go compete. We were just handling the stuff there and taking care of solutions that they needed. What we were also doing, what made this really unique to the independent side that we all are, is there were seven primary direct agents that sold that product and that product only around the country. So we were partnering with them. They thought they were going to lose their program if we didn't figure out this solution on these other lines. So they were kind of embedded with us. And then also there's a little bit of animosity between them and the carrier, right? The carrier's telling them what they're going to get paid, how they're going to get paid what they're cutting, where they're at. So they're building, I kept looking at it the whole time as I'm building a relationship with these seven. I keep finding needs. I got them to redo the contract that they can had to go direct to, to the carrier or to me. They had either option because they needed me for more complex solutions, which allowed them then to start competing with the carrier they had and open that door up and how we negotiated contracts. We continue to look at finding solutions for them and their clients. So the next couple of years, it, it, it stayed about that side, 10, maybe 11 million. That was very, very beginning of cyber. And we're working with a gal named uh, Sandy Maldonado from Hartford in 05 and 06 when nobody knew what cyber insurance was. Probably her either, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at the time, probably me either yeah. too. I mean, I, I'd have to say I knew what it was. So we were just starting those early days of other things we could bolt around they need to have. And that was, that was starting to come up. Then what was happening, some friction got caused between the carrier and these seven direct riders. So we came and they, they didn't have backroom support. So we basically set up a service center for uh -huh. these people. And I started charging them back 2% of all their package premium they were going through. But I provided their backroom, agency management system, everything there. And a couple, I went from just having one person supporting this whole program at the time to now I think I hired two more. And now I had three people on staff and we got our revenue on it up to probably a million and a half, million, maybe million eight, something in that area. This was probably by 2010-ish, okay? 2009, 2010. Also still some friction over here. We went and created a second product. We actually partnered with Berkeley Continental Western, a competing product to allow, there wasn't too much leverage with the carrier over here that was writing it all. I wanted to have somebody else that they pushed too hard. What was going on is they wanted to make these direct riders who are all making really nice livings, you know, really nice commissions. They wanted to make them employees and get making them a company car and mm -hmm. cut them back. Mm -hmm. But we were coming in providing a solution for them in their negotiation. Not to get too complicated or theoretical, yeah. but you asked about philosophy behind it. Yeah. Solution oriented. If they push too hard, they were all going to join us. Yeah. Right. And so it kept leveraging and providing a need, taking care of the need that they had. So finally, when push came to shove, these seven 
um, came in and they had they had a termination clause in their in their contracts. They could terminate them and pull this. Some of these people had nine hundred thousand dollar revenue books of business that they're making. They're paying decent money anymore. here, and they could actually pull their contract in thirty days and assign it to somebody else. They're out of business. Oh, wow. So what I looked at when I came in and pitched it was I pitched it as an insurance policy. Why don't you come join Unico and bring your business to us? It'll become our business. Great buy too. I, I was I think I've joked with you before about it, Elliot, but. We basically bought the books of business at one time's revenue, paid in a third each year. People we were like, that's incredibly cheap. How did you do this? Well, they didn't really own it. Yeah. So basically, they were selling me what the insurance company owned because they were a direct rider for them. Yeah. So they were to them, getting anything was good money. But if I have a $900,000 book and you write me a check for 300000 three years in a row, I'm getting paid for it. And I'm now your employee. Yeah. That's a great deal for them. And it's Absolutely. a great deal for me. Because on top of it, this business was very profitable. Back to your questions earlier, statement around risk management. We we're talking the meeting before the meeting. The business, um, from a risk management standpoint, it was very, very profitable. We hired a full-time person to come in, off the charts, loss control. So we we would do start to do contingencies up to eleven percent at the end of the year on our, on those premiums. So when we pay that guy that nine hundred thousand dollar book, generally three hundred thousand a year, what I was getting back on contingencies for that book of business was more than I was paying him. So I was making money while I was buying books. Buying it. They were winning. This got contentious with the carrier, but we started also trying to play both sides. We were building a relationship there too. Like we like you guys, we want to work yeah. with you guys. Initially, I'm not going to do this because I'm going to lose my business. Finally, I'll, they finally agreed because they felt like they were archaic and going to lose it as long as you only buy one person at a time. So I don't want you to go buy all seven, yeah. and now we're done. Yeah. So what we st- systematically did is we brought one over, the next year one over, the next year one. And so they started coming on board, and we were bringing that business in. The whole time, we were building a better relationship with the carrier, too. So it was it was working, and they were seeing the company grow because what happened for them with the direct riders is some of these people were aging. Some of them were 65, 70, yeah. 75, <laughs> and they're like, I remember the guy in Indiana is now deceased said, it's a cash machine. Why shut it off? They're making so much money. And he doesn't get, he, he owned racehorses and lived in Florida, but his business was in Indiana and he's making 900,000 a year, <laughs> but he wasn't growing. And they're like, I can't, I need a solution. So we kind of pitched them. We're the solution. It's like State Farm. They got the same, they got the same issue, you know, it, all the. To a certain degree. Yeah. To a certain degree. How do you make that transition with those contracts? They, their contracts have changed over the years to help them a little bit more with it. Right. Um, but yeah, so we really took it. So you asked kind of, I'll speed through that process. Those books all came on board. Um, profitable, grew, cyber started to grow, and we got it from there to, to just about $7 million of revenue. This would have been about five years ago, 2016, 2017. We got it all the way from that $1,800 account <laughs> to $7 million of revenue by rolling those books in, continuing to grow, leading with cyber and new things out there as the companies grew. Then we took from about 16, 17, should I pause any question? No. Yeah. So 16, 17, that was kind of the pinnacle from the size, but we didn't have anybody else to bring on. Now we had gotten to about 42, 43 states. We were struggling, like one big state for us was Alaska, and then we just couldn't find comp up there. And so we were starting to struggle with that. Competitors were starting to come at our heels a little bit. And really from then until about two years ago, we, we lost a little bit of size. And they came back and renegotiated that super good contract with that one carrier. One year I did a million six with them in contingencies on um, $20 million. I mean, it's a wow. big, big check. They redid the contract. It's too lucrative. We were doing a million every single year. And we're like, it's profit sharing. You should want to be happy. Yeah. But it was such mm-hmm. a big number that they cut that contract about in half, which was still good. We're still getting 800000 a year. but um, So that hurt us. And they started looking at it. The carriers and the comps started getting more aggressive. So we took a little bit back. So then we've now reinvented ourselves. I'm going to get back to the consultant again. The last two years, uh, I just saw our, uh, yesterday our year, we're up about a million three in revenue this this year from last year, just that that piece. Last year we grew about seven hundred, so almost two million in revenue in the last two years. And what we did different is we started going back to consulting agreements. And we also started playing in the MA space. So again, Back to our roots 20 years ago, not trying to just go out and sell product. We're going out and we're working with all this acquisitions in the space. Private infrastructure groups, private equity groups are coming in. We're normally they come in, buy our company, we lose the business, be gone. Yep. 
Now they're coming in. We've built an expertise around that. We're selling them a reps and warranty policy. We're building an infrastructure around the consulting agreement. Even when they look at somebody, we're able to bill when they're looking at somebody. We've got an agreement we just agreed to sign two weeks ago. The company is doing five or six acquisitions a year. We bill them $7,500 per, per when they look at just to review the insurance. It's a lot long from the 1800 in the beginning days mm-hmm. just to review their insurance, where they're at. So there's nothing there. They might buy, spend $100 million buying a company them to spend seventy five hundred dollars to make sure there's no issues going on with it. It's cheap, especially no compared to attorney fees. They'd be paying to have their attorneys who would probably call us and have us do it anyway. So we're starting to blow that space up. And some of the big companies on the East Coast, which are an area that we couldn't work, we have a big one out of London that we do all their stuff right now. So we've started reinventing from those old days of that regulated industry, mm-hmm. and there's so much there to the today of we're working with people coming in that we still may not write their insurance. They, you know, they they pay $3 million, $5 million a year in premium. We might write a few of their companies, but we're doing consulting engagements. We're making sure they have best practices throughout all the companies they're buying so they're similar. We're building very close relationships at a CEO level with them. And it's, so it's it's really kind of funny thinking back. I didn't think about it until you started asking the questions, how we've gone full circle yeah. and we're right back to consulting. And that's where we start getting our growth again. Well, and I think another theme that I'm just like hearing consistently across this, I mean, all it's so amazing um, is, you know, your thought process around just being innovative on your heels, looking to provide a solution to a problem that the client has. And I feel like, you know, if you take your situation off the table and you look at the risk management industry as a whole, I mean, you don't find that. It's very archaic. It hasn't changed over the last however many hundreds of years, you know, but it's like you you have gone out on a limb, if you will, and ha- have had a forward thinking thought process to kind of forge ahead and it's rewarded you guys significantly. Well, it's, it's solving problems for clients versus just selling them policies that they already have, yeah. which is inherently going down the commodity route, right? Like they can buy that cheaper somewhere else and eventually they're going to be able to buy it from you know amazon or somebody and yep. we all have to transition to be we have to provide valuable advice in order to stay relevant and if we can do that ultimately like you're experiencing now you can actually charge more to the client than we can make through insurance policies you know and so maybe just go back to kind of when you were talking about that building that up through bringing solutions, get a little bit more tactical. Like how did you identify those problems that you could bring a solution to? Was it something that you guys just tried to do or was it just having conversations with clients? Was it like, how did you approach that so that you wouldn't, you know, just be walking in and saying, Hey, let us quote your business or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. So I'll hit real quick. I, I honestly, I think that initially our solutions were more, for those other agents who needed solutions there, right? So necessarily don't always restrict right. yourself just to the actual end of policy holder, the insured. That's Sometimes you can point. take care of other people and that can like, I took care of this attorney or this account who are centers of influence, right? Mm-hmm. And so then they started referring everything in and now we do the law firm. We've done that, that, that accounting firm forever so that, that started because we helped them, right? So as much as we were doing this and building this thing up, I remember a few years ago there was a so we're also heavily involved in state and national associations in this industry. We're kind of, we're the leader in this space in the nation now. So we did a, a function in Chicago and that accountant who thought I did him a favor, we took out a ton of his clients in Chicago and we took the bill for the whole thing. He's like, no, you don't do that. I'm like, no, you don't understand how impactful this has been on our organization to be able to do this. And he's like, I know you wrote this because he still only does these a few Nebraska clients. Now we have 750 clients around the nation mm-hmm. and had no idea and be able to Spark thank them and him. give back. Yeah. But it really isn't. So I'll get to the, the policy because mm-hmm. your question is dead on, Elliot, with it. But we really looked at just solutions for all parties, not being close minded mm-hmm. to selling that product. And so the attorney had a, had a question, the, the accountant had a question. Now the individual agents, I started working with these seven direct riders, they needed help. Then went back to the insurance. And we really value the partnerships we have with our insurance carriers. And we, now we get a little bit egotistical ourselves that we don't, we hate that name agent because I'm an agent of selling your product. And I don't, we don't believe in we're selling your product. We're trying to find solutions for clients. Mm-hmm. And if your product is the product that helps that client, then it's a great partnership. Yep. And our goal is to make you money also. It's not trying to drive that price down and hurt you. We really want to bring the sides together with that. Mm-hmm. So we looked at that carrier who had a problem. They couldn't grow. They couldn't do anything. They had, they were in a fight with their agents and figured a solution there out too. Mm-hmm. And that's where we kept advancing. So each year it kept evolving 
but it was always based on those solutions. Now, up to where we're at today, it really is more client focused. So back to your question on one of the things we've had really good luck, and I think most of the other agencies are listening up too probably is we've hired in the industry. We, we, our last hire that's, that's just on, doing unbelievable, we hired four years ago. He's out in Carolina, and he, but he had 16 years in communication. And what he did was sold software to all of these big companies, not the small original ones, not the, the regulated, but the ones who are doing this space. So at this point, he's 40 years old, been in it since his mid-20s, and knows everybody else who's been coming up. And he's he also, relationship. He, you got it. It's 100% that relationship card that you play, mm. that everybody knows him, that everybody knows us, because we're the largest in the space now. So you have relationships, and all of your discussions are around their business, not around insurance. People don't want to talk about insurance. We do. It's our job, right? Yeah. But for the most part, they don't. So when we're sitting down talking, we do this. Uh, we just got back from Metro in, in Miami in, in February. It's all, all it is is mergers and acquisitions for communications companies. We're the only broker in the nation there. No, nobody else. And it's there's 2,000 people there. And it's all just mergers and acquisitions. So we're sitting there. Our table with meetings is scheduled from probably 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. two days in a row. And you, you're out of there. Mm-hmm. And it, it's quick. But we're different, and all we're doing is talking to them about what they're buying, who they're buying, how they're wanting to buy somebody, what the new new think, trends are happening in the industry there. So we're having those discussions. So when they're ready to look at how they can actually finance the discussion, what they need from HR support, we're bringing our HR team in to do HR conferences for them, help them bring their teams together of two different companies. Who are they going to call? Mm-hmm. They're going to call that person who has that relationship. So we're never really asking for that piece of the order. Normally, what happens is we still get paid by property, casual, employee benefits. Honestly, our growth last couple of years is we never cross-sold the employee benefits. And I hate that term cross-sell now. I can go that way a little bit because we really look at it as business development. Yeah. Let's go in and find solutions. And if that solution happens, happens to be, you know, I'm a PNC person, right? But if that solution happens to be they have a benefits need or they have a consultant need someplace else. I want to get that person in front of them to step back. Mm-hmm. I think too many times in our business, we try to sell people the thing that we know. Exactly. Right, it's the thing that yeah. they need, and I think that's yeah. that's the different approach. Is you build a relationship card, you listen really well, you find out what they need, mm-hmm. you know how to push those buttons, and then you bring the team in that can fit those needs. I mean, that sums <laughs> yeah. that sounds about like what we're right talking there. about quite yeah. a bit. Yeah, because I mean, it, it's funny that you say it that way. I think it's a good good spin on it. Is um, you know, it's almost like you'll you'll get that where where the the client's laying out a perfect opportunity for you to get engaged with them. You just either, you know, you can't recognize it or you're like, well, hey, once we get the insurance, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and, and dive into that. And the client's going, no, I don't care about my PNC right now. It's fine. I need help here. And we talk all the time that you don't have to be the expert in it, but you can be an advisor, right? So you can tell that client, hey, I'm, I don't know benefits. That's not my area of expertise. However, maybe your, your firm is just a PNC firm. Go out and interview three other benefits brokers and say, "Hey, I've got this solution. Let me. I want to bring a solution to my client. Um, who would be the best fit? You know, and go out and just find somebody. You know, there's plenty of people out there. Or build a relationship. Hopefully, you you have relationships with other advisors. You know, that you can bring to the client. But it's it's ultimately providing advice for being a trusted advisor to the client means that you can help them in those areas that you may not be an expert in, and that's totally fine. Well, you could still be a risk manager because it yeah. all boils back to like risk. risk. What if it doesn't happen? Or what if it doesn't happen right? Or it's going to cost me money if it doesn't happen in the most efficient way or whatever it is. You can still keep your risk management hat on 100%. but still solve problems. You bet. Uh, absolutely. I honestly, in a lot of these m a opportunities that we have um, in the communications, we're actually hiring a second one now. The one that's all he does full time is communications. He's got 30 years in the industry. He's in the Oregon Telecommunications Hall of Fame. Um, he's been on. He's been to Alaska. Fifty. I mean, he's this guy. He handles a, a very large uh, fiber uh, to to the premises carrier out, based out of Lincoln, um, and they they think he walks on water. I mean, he just comes in and has that presence about him and that experience. And his same thing is as well as I just want to help. And I think there's a, there's a certain you know having managed sales teams and stuff before. It's it's hard to explain or articulate. I probably won't do a good job today, but. They're pressing because they want to grow because they have demands and sales leaders give them demands. Yeah. But sometimes, and you need to have that sense of urgency, but sometimes you have to have that sense of calm mm-hmm. that when you're working with somebody that we just want to provide that solution and you're not trying to jump 
the gun. You're trying to go in and try to get, I want deck sheets, I want to go sell, and all the stuff that my sales manager is pushing me, yeah. sometimes they're hurting you for that bigger picture, that C-suite type sell, yeah. where you're really understanding their industry, getting to know them, and it does take, it takes a faith thing. I mean, it takes a calmness of just continuing to listen. You have to have, you have to pay the bills, yeah. so you have to have some success. You can have some people, and they, they probably wouldn't make it in too many of our shops, that just want to listen for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> now, at some point, you have to sell yeah. something, right? Yeah. It doesn't pay the bills, but finding that ability... Well, Asking some questions yep. and then listening can help. Well, we talk about all the time, like, because we'll get it where, you know, salespeople will come back and say, well, that, the client's all buttoned up. You know, I didn't find anything. It's like, there's not a business in this world that has all their problems solved. We just didn't find it. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you can find a problem in every single interaction, but it doesn't mean you can leave and just go, no, they're good. Wipe them off the board. Like, it's not going to be a prospect. You say that and you both say that and it's a different topic for a different podcast. And I look at that. But I think it's one of the things we don't, looking at when we hire producers or we call them risk advisors in our office, we don't use the term producer, but um, one of the things we don't rate on is, and I think it's critical, is people that are naturally inquisitive. Mm -hmm. And to you, the people I see successful, they really are good at, and it's because they're naturally interested. You tell me okay. something, it elicits another question. You hear something, they stop to listen, and they when that conversation isn't just my list of questions I have written down, it starts to become, because yeah. I'm listening to you and I'm inquisitive about how'd you get there, how'd that work for you? And that becomes genuine and it helps build that relationship. Bingo. It's hard to rate on that with people, you know, how you do that. Well, we call that the art, and it's really hard, because it is. I mean, you, you would have your technique, I would have my technique, and they'd be a little bit different, but the framework's the same. We call it like, being genuinely curious, you know, yeah. where you just, and you, there's a certain level of business acumen that you need to have and that you gain by, ha you know, by having some of those conversations, but it's amazing a conversation that you can carry on in an industry that you've, you don't have any experience in, but just being genuinely curious. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and, no, I think you're dead on. I do think one of the things that's hard where you can be genuinely, can be authentic and can be real is when you're working with somebody who you enjoy working with too. Yeah. Think about the partners you have here, account managers you work with, but then thinking about how many times when you're young and you're hungry, you're hitting the streets and you're going to call on somebody because it's a big business and you want to write it, not because you're actually interested in the business, not because you're actually like that person. Yeah. You need to so, a number. You need a number. Mm -hmm. And that's that's so much harder and it's so much less enjoyable. I think it stresses people out, can burn them out in the industry. If you can actually go work with people that you like, now. Part of it, you have to be a person that's flexible enough that have to like people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Tell me, well, I don't like anybody. Yeah, I'm not gonna pay the bills again. Right? We still have to pay the bills. There should also be that that fine line. But yeah. I think you really get that genuine curiosity mm -hmm. or authentic interest when you really. And that was probably one of the fortunes too about this communications program you asked about today. Is these are really good people. That a lot of them are rural America. They're rural based. Mm -hmm. That work hard. That are genuinely care. That you really. I mean, I, I fly down and go to a wedding of one of them. This lot, I don't even do his PNC. For another example, we do HR services for him right now. We do some of his benefit stuff. We do a consulting agreement every year because he has a hard time firing his current agent. And he likes them, but he loves us. So we basically make more money in a consulting agreement yeah. than his commission are if we would handle his property casually and we do everything else. And we're like, Probably we're fine. Problem, I don't want him to have yeah. to fire this person. He, he likes them. He's getting the advice and things he needs from us. And he's a great person. And we feel like we're bringing him value and so everybody can win. Yeah, exactly. Well, and guess what? Things will change, and eventually he'll call you. Yep. Maybe. I don't even care. <laughs> I, mean, I kind of like it the way it is right now. I mean, it's yeah. it's fine. It's what he needs. And at some point, if he doesn't need them anymore, and he just needs us, that's great. But we're, we're good either way. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think that was a great conversation. I think everybody will take a ton of value out of that. I, uh, there's a lot in there, a lot to unpack as far as we didn't probably even get into everything else you guys are doing, but. Uh, <laughs> I think that's a good a good topic to, to focus on, I think, is in everything we talk about. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Ray. Yeah, Appreciate man. it. Appreciate you guys inviting me up. I'm glad it works. Thanks, thanks for hosting and what a great place you have here. That was awesome. Thank you for tuning in to Getting Past the Premium. We are excited to continue breaking down barriers and finding solutions together. If you would like to reach out regarding anything you heard in today's episode, find links and contact info in the description. Until next time, have a great day, and let's continue getting past the premium.